Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is September 18th, uh, 2019, and we are very, very excited uh, to have uh, with us today uh, David B. Osler, and David is the author of uh, a brand new book for Latter-day Saints, uh, or Mormons as I like to call them, and the book is called Bridges, Ministering to Those who question. Um, I have read this entire book. It's published by Greg Coford Books, and um, it is a phenomenal book. I don't think uh, there's a page in the book that I haven't marked up, and uh, I have several pages of, uh, of points and questions to ask David, but this is a special book. We'll be digging into it, but the purpose of the book um, is to uh, be a resource to leaders of the church and members of the church, uh, and the CLDS Church, of course, that we're talking about, who are trying to minister to those who are uh, doubting or questioning. So uh, I'm pretty sure the audience for this book is true believing kind of Orthodox Mormons and, and any others who are just sincere in wanting to reach out to those who are struggling in a faith crisis or, and or who have stopped attending church um, as a way to show them Christ-like love. And uh, in that sense, I think I, my first impression was that it's a radical book. And in, in, we'll get into why I think it's a radical book. But the format for today's discussion, uh, and we are live streaming on Facebook for those who are joining us there, and uh, we'll be recording this for YouTube as well. But our, uh, our, our format for today, we're going to maybe spend an hour uh, talking to David just about his own personal story and what led to him wanting to write this book. And then we're going to at least hopefully spend two hours just digging into the book itself and uh, really coming to tease out, uh, teasing out and digging into uh, all of David's recommendations. And uh, I think it's a profound book. And so uh, really quickly, I'll just make one quick announcement. For those who don't know, we are really excited uh, to announce uh, the Thrive uh, Thrive Day that we're having November 17, 2019. It's an all-day conference on a Sunday in Salt Lake City. And uh, the purpose of the Thrive Day conference is to, uh, it's to host an all-day conference for, for Mormons uh, who uh, are unorthodox or who have left the church. But the entire focus of the Thrive Day is to be positive, to focus on healing and growth and community for those who uh, no longer are able to attend church. We have uh, Amber Scora from, from the Jehovah's Witness uh, movement who's coming to keynote. We have Wayne Sermon, who's the lead guitarist of Imagine Dragons. We have several amazing speakers lined up, Natasha Alfred Parker, Christian Moore, Stephanie Sorensen Larson of the Encircle House, um, Donna Showalter, uh, Spencer Nugent, uh, so many cool speakers, others, Mindy Gledhill, others that I haven't mentioned. And again, the whole purpose is to provide healing, support, and community uh, oriented towards growth for those who have left the church. So that, that announcement doesn't totally fit this presentation, but I need to start announcing it because it's two months away and we're trying to get about 3,000 people to attend the conference. It's priced at only $15 for the entire day. We're set to lose a ton of money. Um, there's no financial motive in this event, but we just want to uh, administer to those who have left the church and need support. So in that sense, it is in the spirit of this book, because post-Mormons deserve ministering too. Um, so with that, uh, I come back to uh, this interview, David Osler. It's such a pleasure and an honor to have you on Mormon Stories podcast today. Well, good to meet you, John, and I'm glad to be here. Um, all right. So, uh, as I said, I think this is a groundbreaking book. Uh, I think that this book is an act of courage. I think it's an act of faith. And I think it's a radical book in the sense that it's calling us to be like Christ. And I think Christ, not, not to use extreme rhetoric, but if you looked at Christ, I, I mentioned this to you before we started, if you look at Christ in the context of his day and time, the things that he was teaching were kind of radical. And in that sense, you're calling on all of us to be more Christ-like. And uh, that's how I 
that's how I took the book. Are you okay with that introduction? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, I'm fine with that. I, you use more superlatives than I would. Uh, maybe it was a, an act of courage for me to even write. Um, but uh, I'm glad you feel that way. Yeah, well, I think it's an extremely well-written book. Um, so let's let's start, though, not by talking about the book, but by talking about your story. And I'd love to spend a good 30, 45, 60 minutes just on your background, because that's part of what we do on Mormon Stories Podcast. So where would you begin about your own journey and what <laughs> led you to write this book? Well, um, I'll just give you a brief summary of who I am and my life experience. And I think there's some of my life experience in the book that um, um, helped me um, want to write a book like this. Um, I have a fairly traditional um, youth. I grew up in Salt Lake City uh, on the East Bench. Um, um, my dad was a leader. I did all the things that... Um, one does as a youth in church, uh, Eagle Scout, uh, go on a mission, graduate from seminary. I think I graduated from seminary. You know, I, I went early admissions to the University of Utah, so I'm not sure I uh, completely finished that last uh, semester of seminary, but, you know, was was active in, in every way. Served a mission in, in Japan, um, came back and uh, uh, married uh, Rochelle Taylor, uh, Rochelle's... Uh, you know, an important part of my life and my family. And and um, shortly after I graduated from the University of Utah, uh, we moved back to New Hampshire and largely raised our family in the New England area. I got a graduate degree from Dartmouth College in business and um, took my first job in Boston and then moved back to the Hanover, New Hampshire area. Uh, Hanover is kind of famous for church lingo because that's where the doctor came to operate on Joseph Smith's legs. So it's very much in a, uh, you know, a part of the history of the church. Um, and we lived there for almost 20 years and, um, uh, you know, worked in, um, established a career in what I would call evidence-based medicine. This is kind of the way in which one takes, um, looks at healthcare and uses data and processes to uh, make it more effective um, and to be able to use evidence to prove out particular pathways for healthcare so that you assure yourself that you're getting the right kind of care. Um, and so it's a very much of an inquisitive uh, profession where one is kind of saying, okay, you say that this treatment will help someone, but where's the data that shows that? And so data and analytics became really kind of part of who I am, um, both because of that career and probably just because of the way in which my brain is wired. Uh, it was a very rural life, and, you know, that's kind of an interesting life. We loved it. It was just wonderful. Um, and uh, uh, why there? We, we um, raised six of our own children, and we had two foster children that we raised. They joined us when they were... Um, kind of a nine and 12, I think. They were sisters. They are sisters. And so we, we raised them. So we had a rich family life um, and a rich church life. Uh, you know, I served as a bishop, a young bishop. I think I was 33 or something and knew less than I know now, and I know <laughs> very little now. Um, and then became a stake president while I was there and, and was responsible for I think we had 13 congregations spread out through kind of 200 miles of rural New Hampshire. And um, we love that. And since that time, we've moved a number of times. We, we moved uh, to Salt Lake and lived here for five or six years and then moved to Minnesota. Um, uh, and then um, my last job was in London, England, where I was responsible for a number of international healthcare businesses uh, for a large multinational company. Uh, so we retired maybe seven, eight years ago. Um, and then after that, my wife and I, uh, being in the career I was, I traveled a lot. And so I wasn't with my family as much as I would have liked. And it was nice to be able to retire um, early because of, um, you know, fortunate financial circumstances. And so my wife and I uh, went to India and we lived in India for a year uh, doing some humanitarian work. Uh, it was in southern India, uh, kind of in a very rural area, 
uh, we, we worked with those that are affected by leprosy and uh, kind of had a really interesting experience there. We lived there for about a year and um, we weren't there all the time. We did some wonderful vacations and went to places of the world we hadn't seen before. And, uh, but it was just fun to do that with Rochelle and, and uh, uh, kind of step away from kind of the corporate world and live in a more humanitarian world. And while there, um, I got a call from the church to serve as the mission president in Sierra Leone, West Africa. Uh, and so Rochelle and I went there. Um, this would have been 2013. And uh, uh, worked in, this is one of the poorest countries in the world. Most people don't know where it is, and but it's in West Africa. And uh, it's probably most famous now for either blood diamonds uh, and the civil war that happened there in the late 1990s or in the Ebola epidemic um, that we experienced and ended up closing the mission in 2014. So we lived there as just stark poverty. I mean, this is a place where one out of, um, I think, eight children die before the age of five. One out of 12 women die in childbirth. So, you know, you're dealing with kind of extreme poverty and... and um, we loved our time there. It's not a simple mission, um, but we, we loved the time there. And then it was cut short as the mission needed to be closed because of that epidemic. And we had all of our missionaries reassigned to other missionaries and we came home. So you don't get reassigned as a mission president? You know, they don't have any missions that don't have mission presidents. <laughs> so it's not like, you know... Actually, occasionally that does happen. <laughs> yeah, well, they call them pretty fast. If, if a mission president gets in trouble... Yeah, uh, they, they'll, they'll replace him, but... Yeah, and sometimes they'll do a <laughs> kind the, of a parachute of someone in there. But the timing has to be perfect, yeah. Yeah, so we came home for a couple of months, and then, um, uh, you know, on a, on a Tuesday, I got an email. This was maybe four months later. Tuesday, I got an email from someone in the missionary department saying, you know, what's your phone number? So you kind of wonder about that, right, you know? Hmm. And then on Thursday, we got a call from a general authority saying, what are you doing? So we told him what we were doing, and he says, you know, I'll probably give you a call on Friday. So on Friday, he called us and asked us to serve as the directors of the historic sites in, at Hill Camorra. And, um, and the only complication on that was, and we're doing training in Provo for all the, or for all the historic sites directors on Monday. Uh, would you, could you accept the call and go to your training on Monday? <laughs> so we quickly went to Nordstrom's and bought cold weather gear since our Sierra Leone mission attire really wouldn't <laughs> kind of cover uh, upstate New York winters and, um, and then went on our mission on that Monday. And so we served there for, for a while, um, being responsible for the missionaries at the historic sites at the Hill Camorra, the Joseph Smith Farm, the Whitmer Farm and the the Grandin Printing Building there in Palmyra. Um, so, um, you know, we've done a lot of different things, John. We've moved around. We've seen a lot of different cultures. We've so you've been a bishop, a stake president, and a mission president. Yeah. Wow. And um, um, but all in very different context. Um, all in um, kind of circumstances that are kind of not main Wasatch Front kinds of situations. Um, uh, and having lived on four continents in four years, North America, you know, Europe, a uh, Asia with India and Africa, you know, we've just seen a lot of the world and have kind of comfort in the diversity of the world. And, um, you know, that's been wonderful for us to be able to see that and have it shape our views. So that kind of takes us up to maybe 2016 or so. And that's when you, the the first inklings of the book started emerging? Yeah, so we got another calling. Um, so we're back in our stake um, in Northern Virginia. We live... Can I can I jump back for one second? Sure. Is that okay? So what year did you graduate from high school, just so I can get a sense for... 75. 75. So I'm 62. So you're 12 years older than me. Okay, so um, because, because I think a lot about all the people that come before not only your work, but mine. Um, I'm, I'm really, and, and because your book, like if I were my best self, the best possible self, 
I almost feel like this is the book that I would have aspired to write. And I've been doing this a long time. So, uh, you know, I've been doing this formally since 2004, 2005, but uh, I've been doing it informally since 2001. And so, but I've also been paying attention since, since the 19, early 1990s. And, um, and so I'm curious, uh, you know, you, you channeled this book uh, somehow wrote it in a couple of years and yet, uh, it's, it's including so much. And so I'm just curious. So like when dialogue was started with, with Gene England in the sixties and as dialogue kind of was doing its thing, dialogue, the journal of Mormon thought seventies, eighties, nineties, were you aware of dialogue journal? You know, distantly, but I wasn't kind of a reader of, or, you know, wasn't, I wouldn't say that I was following kind of those cultural or academic analyses of, you know, Mormon life. Okay. You know, so I, I don't have that history and background. So same with Sunstone, you would have never right. attended Sunstone or no, and read, I, read Sunstone magazine? You know, I certainly would have been nervous about Sunstone. It kind of has a, yeah. a brand that, right. you know, was different than the, you know, what I was comfortable with. Sure, sure. And so... Would you have heard at some point about Von Brody's book or or the Tanners? Like, yeah, would, I knew would, I knew of them. Okay, uh, but I hadn't read them. You know, I growing up or in my probably thirties or forties, you know, those would have been anti Mormon. Yeah, and so I wouldn't have read them. Got it. I, I was aware of them. Perfect. And then, would when the September six stuff happened in ninety three, where the scholars were excommunicated, would you have known about that in ninety three? Yeah, I knew about it, but you know, I'm I'm living in New Hampshire, right? You know, and we have more moose than we have members of the church in New Hampshire. <laughs> so, you know, this did you say moose? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a lot of moose in New Hampshire, and there aren't a lot of members in New Hampshire. So, um, you know, I'm living in rural life, and you know, the internet is kind of nascent. You know, there's some stuff that's out on it uh, about this time. I'm aware of it. Um, and uh, I, I lived in uh, a ward that is uh, uh, an academic ward. It, it was a ward around Dartmouth College. Mm -hmm. And so there were folks that um, uh, would be aware of this. And so, you know, it would kind of surface, but not in a mainstream sort of way at church. Um, so I think you're kind of asking, you know, what in my background kind of made me comfortable with the material and maybe in some ways a life experience that prepared me to, to think this way. Kind of, but I'm also like curious if any, if all this was done in three years or if, if there were touchstones along the way where you either had your own faith crisis or got exposed to some of these materials earlier on. And if so... How you dealt with it because i you know after september 6 there would have been you know blogs and podcasts emerging in yeah. 2005 and then you know eventually the church would have started excommunicating well i mean before that there were lots of efforts to try and do similar work to yours like, like when i created the stay lds yeah. website when when you know just over the past 10 years many of us have tried even pre patrick mason's book pre thomas mcconkey's book Lots of efforts to try and build understanding, to get to yeah. build compassion, to try and get the church to understand. And my sense is you kind of weren't aware of any of that um, until just a few years ago. Yeah, I mean, I um, I wasn't aware of your work until probably two years ago. Um, so even the excommunication, you yeah, I was aware that you had okay. been excommunicated, okay. Okay. but I, I mean, we were living in London and then Africa and India, yeah, yeah. you know, and so we weren't kind of confronted with these kinds of issues just because of where we lived and, you know, our stage of life. And, you know, I'm flying to China every other week. Yeah, so sure. sure. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, so it's busy. Um, uh, I, I think I've always been um, uh, aware that um, people's life experiences are so different and that um, we do better when um, we understand those differences as we minister. So I, I recall, for example, so I'm a young bishop. When, how, when was I called as a bishop? Probably 1990, somewhere in there, um, maybe 89. So, you know, I'm young, you know, and know nothing. Um, 
but I'm aware that um, uh, uh, the male, uh, you know, the patriarchy of the church, the male leadership structure in the church um, is, is really difficult for uh, many women and some men. And so we would plan our sacrament meetings to have all women speakers. And we'd be overt about that because we felt like that was important uh, because women need to be visible in in our meetings. And women can give just as good a talks as men can. Mm -hmm. And um, women talk differently and have different life experiences. And we need to look up and see people like us. And so, you know, I, I do things like that. Um, and I'd be really comfortable with that because... Um, that would reach kind of the individualness. So I, I wouldn't say that I'm, I'm, I'm woke or you know anything like that. But um, you know, I, I, I think I was very comfortable examining what do we need to do in order to be helpful. What do we need to do to be able to reach each person in the pew? And I have a lot of regrets about my lack of understanding about that. I have a lot of regrets about mistakes I made in that period of time, because now with you know another twenty years or thirty years of experience, I can see um, that even though I was aware of some issues, I wasn't aware of many issues, and because I wasn't aware of them, I'm sure I did stupid things, and you know I know I did because I I get woken up in the middle of the night, you know as I kind of relive some of those experiences where. You know, I just blew it because I didn't know any better or because I was lazy or because I didn't have understanding or, you know, because I wasn't in a good mood or whatever. And so um, so uh, I've also had personal experience in my family. Um, uh, I We raised eight children. Um, not all are um, active members of the church. Um, they've had their own life experiences that have... Uh, played out and they have, some of them have, I guess all of them do, everyone has different beliefs. Some of their differences have led them away from the church. But that was really more in the 2014-15 kind of time frame and and not earlier. Okay. Um, so that might have prepared the soil a little bit, having yeah. some of your own children leave the church? Yeah. So, you know, every mission we serve, one of our children gives us a call during the mission saying, hey, dad, mom, you know, can't do this anymore. And Mm. So, um, uh, so it was really kind of in that time frame where, where my own adult children, my youngest child now is 25, 26. Um, so my children are older and they're starting to make, uh, young adult decisions or adult decisions. And sometimes they make decisions that take them away from the faith. Um, so after we came back from Palmyra, uh, we got a call in our stake to, um, it was called a church service mission, so it actually was badged. You know, we had badges, we never wore them. But we were called to minister to the singles in our stake. And in Washington, D.C., there is a young single adult stake. So if you're a young single adult and active, likely you will be attending the young single adult stake. There is also a mid-singles ward. So if you're over the age of 30, it may even go to 45 or 50. You might be attending the mid-singles ward. So most of the singles in our stake um, don't attend because they're choosing, you know, they're not in one of these other uh, single-type wards. So we had about 1,000 of them and about 800 of them don't attend church. Yeah, you said in the book like 20% attended, right? Yeah, so yeah. it's about 1,000 and 800 yeah. and 200. So... Um, uh, you know, we're not an inner city stake. We have lots of leadership. So they weren't looking for us to go out and knock on doors. And because the ward has that capacity to knock on doors and find out why someone's not coming to church. So we wanted to be maybe more systematic and say, well, so we got these 800 people. Why don't they come? Um, you know, so let's ask them. So that's really kind of where the book's origins came. Your was, first, the survey, the first survey you did uh -huh. about why the young people weren't attending. Yeah. Had you ever had anything like a faith crisis yourself prior to that time? No, I don't think so. I mean, um, would I be nuanced? I don't know what nuanced means. You know, um, uh, was I comfortable with... Um, 
Uh, no, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a believing member of the church. Like the dark, you, you talk about the dark night of the soul in the book. I haven't had a dark night of the soul. You've never had that. No. When you talk in, when you talk about kind of the historical problems that people end up stumbling on in the book, like, you know, polyandry or book of Abraham or whatever, had you struggled significantly with that? Did you, were you aware of the, the major kind of CES letter type issues prior to this calling? And if yeah. so, had you struggled with them or grappled with them or were they just not problems? For you? No, I I was aware of them. Um, so there's kind of nothing. Is, is there anything that I kind of hit in my research for the book that I didn't know before? Not kind of academically. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not like I never knew about Meadow, Mount Meadows Massacre. You know, I, I knew about that. You knew about polyandry. You knew, knew about, about the Book of Abraham problems. But I probably hadn't read... You know, the story of the Kimballs bringing their daughter over to Joseph, you know, right. that's probably a story I hadn't read. Got it. Um, did some of those things trouble me? Yeah. I mean, I grew up in the 60s during um, a time when blacks couldn't hold the priesthood. And that uh, troubled you? Pardon? That troubled you? Yeah. Yeah. I remember, um, and I think I allude to this in, in the book, you know, I, I went backpacking with a friend up into the mountains and... And uh, I think I'm 18 at the time. I think it's the year before my mission, if I get that right. It might have been the year of my mission, but I, no, it was the year before my mission. So I was 18. And, you know, I I, uh, I kind of felt an impression that, you know, it, it'll work itself out. And um, so I was able to still go on a mission. And I'm not sure I was... At the point, I, I wasn't in crisis about it. I was aware of it. It bothered me. Uh, I was concerned about it. And I remember where I was in Japan on my mission when I heard about the proclamation allowing blacks to fully participate in the church. Um, and, uh, you know, that was great blessing. I, I felt joy and happiness about that and felt like some burden had been removed. Um, so I... I my wife and I have always kind of been able to talk about these kinds of issues, and I think that's been helpful. Uh, I've been able to see things from her perspective. Rochelle has strong feelings about the importance of women and sometimes how we dehumanize women in the church. And and um, so I, I've been more sensitive to those issues. I still don't get it because I don't live her experience, um, but I can understand a lot of it. Um, and that can shape the way in which I act and you know, when I'm a leader, to be in a particular way. Um, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm aware of these kinds of issues. Probably the issue that I was least aware of because I had the least experience about it was some of the challenges of sexual orientation and sexual identity. And I, I think those are more issues I started becoming more acutely aware probably in 2013 and 14. I'd, and uh, I don't have any immediate family members who or gay or lesbian or transgender that you know of that I know of. Yeah. I, I have a cousin that I know of, but, um, but your brother's done a lot of work. In the so LGBT my brother arena. has, yeah. And his name is uh, Richard Osler. Richard Osler. Yeah. A Papa Osler to many. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm not sure kind of where his timing was. If I kind of go back through, it's probably about in the 2015, 16, 14 timeframe that, that he's, starting to talk about these issues. And so um, uh, I remember my own process of trying to understand issues of sexual orientation. And and uh, you know, I have a, a daughter who um, uh, has been able to help me understand these issues. And so I can ask her questions and she'll say, well, dad, you need to think about it this way. Well, what about this? And she says, well, yeah, but here's why. And, and she'll help me kind of walk through in my own mind um, what, how I can think about things a little bit differently. So I've, I've had some mentors that have helped me where um, I've wanted to learn something um, and, and they can help me learn it because my own life experience maybe isn't exposed that way. And, um, and, and that's been wonderful. And my children have really been a help for me in many ways in addition to Rochelle. So if I were to summarize what I've heard, tell me if this is right. You... There's, there's n none of the historical issues that you mentioned in the book 
were you unaware of prior to starting to think about the book? But maybe, well, number one, none of them had ever caused you to seriously doubt the church. And two, you probably didn't maybe dig into them deeply, but you just had a general understanding of the main issues. True? Yeah, I probably dug in more deeply on polygamy. You know, that, that, was, that was one probably became aware of Joseph Smith's polygamy in the late two, you know, probably 2005, 2008. So was that with Rough Stone Rolling coming out or? Well, I read Rough Stone Rolling. I think I knew about it before. Um, I remember going to Wikipedia once and kind of going through, you know, what Wikipedia said about it. And that, so, you know, I... I didn't learn it at church, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I'm not exactly sure how I learned it. Yeah. I did learn it. It, mm. it's bothered, it bothered me at the time. Right. Um, I think it's one of those challenges that we, you know, have to, that, that can be difficult for people. Um, uh, it's our history. It's who we are. It's where we came from. Um, and uh, so I can understand why it's difficult. And, you know, for me as a believing member of the church, uh, I have to say, well, you know, if it was wrong and a mistake, can I still believe in Joseph Smith and his prophetic role? And and I can. So I've had to ask myself that question. Um, uh, so, I, but that wasn't a dark night of the soul. It didn't challenge kind of the very, you know, foundations of who I am and what I believe. So uh, I want to kind of honor that some people have, you know, real dark dissonance with regards to, to to some of these issues, and and I did not, even though there were, and still are, and always will be. It's called faith. It's it's messy. It's who we are. It's full of imperfect people, and um, uh, uh, you know. So I think that there are those things that uh, 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 you know we are just messy. So you. You've had some exposure to the historical issues, but nothing that ever really caused you to kind of go down the rabbit hole of of really questioning the church's truthfulness. No. Yeah. That's remarkable that you can write a book so compassionate and so spot on without having been through the thing you're trying to minister to. But I think your methods that we'll get to in the book about really listening... <laughs> And and connecting with people must be how you how you pull that off because you just really listened with your full heart and with an open mind, and that's how you came to understand something that you had never been through yourself, maybe. Yeah, and um, I mean, I I want to kind of face who we are and where we come from. It. You, you can't skate over that. You can't move beyond it. I, I know that um, a few years ago, uh, when traveling back from St. George to Salt Lake City, uh, we chose to take the long road and go through um, the Mountain Meadows area. I'm not sure there isn't a town there, but we you know went to the historic site that was there. Um, we did that with um, a couple of our kids, um, and that was important for me to, to go there and um, kind of recognize uh, the darkness of of that event, um, and to um, to be willing to face that. Um, uh, I, I know, as a missionary at the historic sites, when when I would greet visitors, I would often um, quote from different accounts of Joseph Smith's. Uh, story of the first vision, um, because there are multiple accounts, and I think it's important to acknowledge them and and um, uh, you know recognize the reality of that, even though that's difficult for some people. Uh, mm -hmm. We would talk about seer stones at uh, the Whitmer farm uh, and hats and things like that. That you know that's kind of where we come from. Um, we're in New York and not in Kirtland, so we don't have to talk about polygamy. Um, but so, you know, that's who we are. I, I remember, um, as I was writing this book, um, it was, a, as I was thinking about writing the book, I still hadn't committed to writing the book until, um, about May of 2018. So wow. that's, that's when I, I said, okay, I'm going to, going to do it. And I, um, 
I was on a trip uh, going through Germany. And uh, I'm just going to pull out my phone because I want to read the quote. And uh, Germany is fascinating um, for all sorts of reasons. But we were in eastern Germany, and in particular, uh, traveling through Berlin. And in Berlin, so much of um, the historic sites that we saw there that were really interesting were um, related to Nazism. And um, we were traveling through the Berlin if I can't find this, I'll be really disappointed. I think I can paraphrase it. We were traveling through the Berlin uh, metro station, and there was a quote on the wall in English, and it's by a civil rights leader, an American civil rights leader named James Baldwin. And the quote was, that which we cannot confront, we cannot change. Um, and I think I got that quote right without looking at the picture. I'm bad at memorizing things. Um, but... But that, to me, became uh, kind of a guiding principle um, with regards to this issue. It, it's uh, people leaving the church, um, my children leaving the church, you leaving the church, or whoever feeling like they can no longer be there, to me, represents, um, to some extent, a failure in the church. I, I realize that, that um, the church isn't for everyone. But the church could be for more people if we could confront who we are and confront um, uh, some of the difficulties associated with disaffiliation. And, and so I felt like I needed to confront it um, and confront it in a way that um, would be accessible to a traditionally believing member of the church and could be understanding and not threatening to them, but was honest to the issue. So that's the tension that I felt in the book was how to be, how to accurately and honestly represent the voices of those who have chosen to leave or struggle to stay. Um, but to put that in a format and a structure um, that would allow um, someone with my background um, or someone who's less maybe aware of these issues to become uh, understanding. Um, and that was really the approach that I did with the book. And I, I, I felt like it needed to be written because um, uh, there's there are resources, uh, you, we can discuss the quality of them, that are kind of focused on someone who has questions or someone who's in a faith crisis or someone who's left. There's a lot that's directed that way. There's little that's directed to leaders and parents um, on, on how to consider this as an issue. And, and we both know, and, you know, I think probably the vast majority of your members or your, your listeners here know that, um, leaders often, uh, act out of ignorance on these issues and have preconceptions about reasons for disaffiliation. Um, and because, um, they, and, and, and they do it usually in really good intention but because of their lack of understanding there, um, they are not often, they're not always helpful. And sometimes they're even hurtful in the process of faith crisis and religious deconstruction um, and just even questioning or doubts. You know, it doesn't have to be a dark night of the soul. It just can, or it can be in just differences of who we are. So, you know, that that's kind of where I, I I wanted to take the the book and the the information. So, um, when you first made that decision to write the book, did someone ask you to write it? Was it just was there some impetus other than reading that quote? Was there some event that kind of really either that you attribute to leading to the writing of the book, personal event, or some request or some external influence or influences? So, in this assignment. One of where we kind of got with it was um, we uh, uh, wanted to work with our stake leaders, stake and ward leaders, to help them understand these issues. This is in the Virginia stake. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're we're working with these leaders and trying to communicate this, and 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 leaders have a lot that's going on. Um, you know, we're one of many of their priorities. There's a lot of changes going on in the church, et cetera, and. Um, I, um, I felt like um, there, 
uh, simply were not good resources for them to understand this, and it couldn't be handled in a 10-minute presentation. So, you know, we were, we were talking to bishops and ward council members and state council members and kind of had, would have 15 or 20 minutes on an agenda, and we, we'd go through and kind of talk about some of these issues. But because there often was the disconnect of, you know, well, don't everyone, doesn't everyone leave because they want to sin or because they've been offended? To, no, there's, you know, really some significant issues that if we talk about, we can respond effectively. And that's not a 15-minute conversation. You know, that's a longer conversation. Yeah. And so in those settings, there really wasn't an ability to go from here's where we are today to here's where we could be and to do that kind of quickly and effectively. Um, and, and so kind of in my mind, I realized that... Um, there needed to be a, a more comprehensive resource on this than a set of, um, you know, five slides in a PowerPoint presentation, you know, that would kind of tip everyone over and, and help them see something they haven't seen before. You know, we're really asking our, for many of our, our leaders and our families and our parents to, to go through a shift of perspective um, that is not simple. Um, and that hasn't um, always been taught at church in a way that allows that change to occur quickly. It's, it's not, you can't just have a general conference talk and say, you know, we're going to rename, you know, the church, you know, from the Mormon church to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Everyone picks up on that really easily. But when you talk about the reasons why someone might disaffiliate, you have to, it's far more complicated to change people's views as to why people might disaffiliate than simply a, a simple conference talk. So that means you have to write a book. Did you did you like check with church headquarters, check with any general authority contacts or friends, and say, "Hey, I want to do this"? Did was there any communication about this as a project that kind of had support from uh, no people inside the church? No, I mean I know some people inside the church and. Um, uh, but I, I, um, I, I didn't feel I either needed permission to do that. Um, I also didn't feel like um, uh, uh, I didn't feel uncomfortable about doing it. Like they would be, you know, angry or sad or feel like I'm going the wrong direction. I, I asked. Um, a number of folks that I know, whether there's kind of training for stake and word leaders on talking about disaffiliation that comes through kind of the traditional channels um, uh, and didn't feel like there, there was. Um, I, I realized that there's a lot of variation between um, kind of the ecclesiastical leaders that stake presidents work with, which are really area and general authority 70s. And in their coordinating councils, you know, there's a lot of variation between what one um, general or area authority will say and what goes on in another council because there are different people and there's different needs that are there. I, I'm aware that some have addressed this and I'm aware that some, maybe most, don't address it. You know, there's other issues that they feel important to address when they get all the stake presidents in an area together. So I didn't feel like I needed permission. I didn't feel like they'd be mad if I did it. <laughs> did you have Coford Books uh, as a targeted publisher from the start? or No, I wanted to publish it through Deseret Book. Oh, okay. So, you know, my focus was make this as safe as possible for a leader to be able to pick up. Um, and so I went through the process there, um, met with them, gave them an early draft of several of the chapters, because Tom Christopherson and the Gibbonses had been able to publish mm -hmm. through Desert Book. Yeah. And um, I'm very sympathetic to the reason why they cannot publish my book. There's too much in here that is leadership focused. And um, I have a whole chapter called Ministering at Church. And, you know, I give direction or guidance or thoughts or ideas to, to bishops and ward councils and stake presidencies and stake councils. And Desert Book doesn't publish leadership books. And if you go through their books, you'll see that they don't do that. So even if you look at the Givens books or Tom Christopherson's books, they don't 
direct leaders or give advice to leaders on that. And I felt like it was an important part of the book and that I needed to have that in. I would have hoped that they could have published it, but but they, um, uh, uh, I think they sincerely considered it and, and their response to me was, um, we just don't do leadership books. Got it. Um, so, it, it, by the way, they're selling it. It's um, it's on their website and it's in their stores. They so, just, oh, that's good. So it, it can't be published through them, but you know they do publish other, or they do sell other books. A good example of another book that they sell is um, Rough Stone uh, Rolling. <laughs> well, Rough Stone N- N- Nyland McBain's book on right. women at church. That's a covert book as well. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, and you know that's that's um, a great book. I, I I read that book probably before both of my missions, and I think it came out maybe in 2011 or 12 or 13, somewhere in there. So, you know, I've read that book, and and, and to some extent, I felt like this book needed to, in some ways, model itself after Nyland's book. Mm-hmm. You know, it was all, she has a paragraph in there about how everything in the book is consistent with church policy and practice, and she really tried to write that book, I think. I haven't talked with her about it, but in a way that would be accessible to uh, a leader. Yeah. Okay. So I I can see at least three challenges if I were to consider writing a book like this from your perspective. One is how do I understand what it's really like to go through the dark night of the soul if I've never gone through it? Yeah. The second is um, whatever recommendations I'm going to make, uh, how do I know that the award or a stake setting would be compatible with the recommendations that I'm making. And then a third would be, how would I know that the recommendations that I make, even if award and a stake were fully amenable to your recommendations, how would I, how would I experiment that these recommendations actually are effective at ministering to people in a faith crisis? So this is a big question, but how, how did you prepare and gather the information necessary so that you could know, I, I feel pretty good about nailing the faith crisis thing and the dark night of the soul. I feel pretty confident that my recommendations will work in a church setting and that they'll be effective for those who are being administered to. Well, yeah. Did you understand that? Yeah, I do okay. understand yeah. it. And I'm, I'm you know, <laughs> uh, I, I think I understand the answers to one and two better than three. Okay. But, um, so in terms of number one, you ask people, <laughs> you know. What's it like to have a faith crisis? Yeah. And so. And you interviewed, what, 20 people? How uh, many? I probably interviewed about 40 or 50. And you surveyed. Uh, so I did a survey uh, and had 320 respondents of people who said they were currently in a faith crisis. And so, how did you recruit? Uh, so I went through some Facebook groups. Facebook groups. So okay. it's what Jana Reese calls a snowball survey. Right. So it's not statistically valid. It's uh, you not know, representative. I, not representative. But it's a common way social scientists recruit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I got 320 or so. Maybe it's, I can't quite remember, but it's in the low 300 respondents. And, um, and I asked them to respond to about 75, I think, statements or questions like, um, do you believe wholeheartedly in the teachings of the church? And I use some similar wording um, of of uh, questions to try and tie back to work that uh, Benjamin Knoll and Jana Reese had done that had been published in Dialogue magazine, what was that, winter of 2017, 16, somewhere in there, and um, so that I could match up. And, but I asked, um, you know, questions about what triggered their faith crisis? What are the concerns? Do they feel like they belong at church? Do they trust church leaders um, and the like? And so there were a lot of questions that I asked there. Um, I also created a, a, a faith crisis focus group and had about uh, 85 people. This was a closed Facebook group, and I recruited people that would be willing to answer questions. It's interesting. There's a number of them that no longer in a faith crisis and they've left the church. And, um, you know, but these people were in a faith crisis at the moment. And so I could ask them questions um, and I could try and understand what they were experiencing. And I could understand um, uh, 
what would be helpful to them at church. Uh, and I think I explored some pretty interesting issues with them, and I learned a lot. And then I did interviews with people. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you're the master of interviews. You know how important these are for people, um, and not just for the person who's being interviewed as a chance to kind of voice and express their experience. Um, but for someone like me, it, it was just wonderful to be able to have them tell me things um, that would help me understand this issue better. And I, I use a couple of these stories in the book. Um, because you use I, a couple of proxy, you use two proxy mm -hmm. kind of Two, two stories. major stories there. What are their names? Um, Mike and Amanda. I have to be careful that I... <laughs> don't use the real names. Don't use the real names. <laughs> but um, um, and what was interesting, both of them after the interviews um, thanked me for the interview. Yeah, you mentioned what their comments. We'll, we'll, maybe we'll come back to that in your last chapter, right? Yeah. You talk about their reactions to the book. But go ahead, what were you going to say? It, it's really important for people to feel heard. Yeah. Um, and there were a number of interviews that I did that are not in the book. And um, a fellow who I interviewed um, and then didn't retain contact with him until the book came out, he messaged me after the book came out. And he said, Dave, I, I just want you to know that that interview that you did with me uh, allowed me to stay in the church. Just doing the interview. I didn't mm. even help him, right? Yeah. I didn't even say, well, you know, here's the magic answer for how you can stay in the church. It was just being heard. Yeah. Helped him feel like he could stay in, I don't know if he'll stay in forever, because, you know, we need to be heard every day, not just once a year, or once every 10 years. So, yeah. but, um, so I've had enough of those experiences to know how important it is for those stories to be heard. And um, so I wanted to be able to personally understand it and respect it and then write about it in a way that really honored uh, those, that, the individual experiences that people had. And I, I think I write about it in the introduction. This, this was an area that surprised me. Um, the level of pain and challenge of going through a dark night. Um, that surprised me. Um, you know, I had heard stories like, well, if you just leave the church, just leave the church, you know, and why is it a big deal if you don't want to come? And I, I realized in a way that I hadn't before how our whole lives are wired. If you grow up in the church and, and serve as both Mike and Amanda had uh, throughout their whole lives up until that point in a way uh, that would be considered orthodox, and then faith breaks, how tremendously devastating that is emotionally and psychologically. I, I just didn't understand that. And I still kind of only understand it intellectually because I haven't had that same experience. Um, but I, I did enough of these interviews to respect that that is true for many, many people. So between the... 20 or, did you say 20 or 40 interviews? About 40. 40 interviews and over 300 survey mm -hmm. respondents. And the focus group of 85 and the, and the Facebook focus group. Mm -hmm. Any other, like you had mentioned the Greg Prince uh, study that I did with Greg and yeah. Travis Stratford and Hans Matson and any other background research or resources that you consulted? I'm just curious. Well, I mean, I kind of... I kind of went everywhere. So, you know, I have frequented the Exmo Reddit thread. I've listened to podcasts, a lot of different kinds. Which were some of your main podcasts that you listened I, to? I listened to Bill Real. I mentioned I've listened to a couple of yours. I listened to Gina Colvin. Uh, Dan Witherspoon. Dan. Mormon Matters, A Thoughtful Faith. Yeah. Mormon Discussions. Uh, I didn't kind of know. I mean, I... I now have a subscription to Dialogue Magazine. Um, <laughs> you can toss out others and see if I've heard of them or listened to them. But I, I kind of, I mean, I'm retired, so I've got time. Um, and so I, I'd listen to a lot. I'd read a lot. I'd, um, you know, follow. I'd be in Facebook groups. People would let me be in Facebook groups so that I could, because of what I was trying to accomplish, and they knew I was sincere and could abide by the rules and the privacy associated with that. Um, and, uh, you know, um, it changes you. Uh, you know, it, it, you don't 
kind of experience um, what other people are experiencing and not change. And, and um, uh, I don't think that's been a, like a crisis of faith, but it has kind of opened my eyes to some of the, the limitations of uh, our ability to, to reach out to people who have differences. And, and they, aren't, they aren't kind of doctrinal constraints. They aren't policy constraints, although there are some policies that are really difficult. But so much of it is, is just the social structure of our wards um, and our uh, preconceptions about certain ideals and ideas that get in the way of, of doing that. And so um, it is sometimes hard for me to to see us do something where where I know that the doubter that's sitting two pews away from me is is hearing those words uh, in a way that the speaker or the leader doesn't see, didn't intend, but you know it's being felt that like that by that person. Um, and, you know, it just makes you sad. And then it makes you doubly sad to know that you were that leader, you know, at one point. And, you know, you were the one that was saying things that you thought were the right things to say. But with more understanding, you realize that, you know, you, you um, didn't have understanding. Did you, in your research, did you get a sense for the stakes in terms of individual depression and anxiety, in terms of, you know, marital disruption, in terms of potential divorce and the fracturing of families, in terms of alienation between between spouses, between parents and children, siblings, um, and even the, the possibility of severe mental illness or suicide? Yeah connected to the faith crisis? Did you, were I, you able to get... I, I was, but not as systematic as now I wish I had. So if I were to write a second edition, uh, I would go down those roads and specifically go around, go down the road of marriage. Um, I, I, I should have had at least a section in the book about um, marriage. There. Navigating a mixed faith marriage? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, I don't have a mixed faith marriage. Um so I focused more on, you know, what I personally were, was aware of, which is the leadership challenges and the parental challenges. Um, and I, I think if, if I had had more insight into that, um, uh, that I've gained post-publication, I would have added things there. Are you I, considering a second edition? <laughs> second edition. You know, John, I'm a business guy. <laughs> uh, to ever think I would write a book in the first place and then to think about like revising it, I don't know. Um, I think, you know, I, I'm not thinking about it, but who knows (laughs) what happens.